Chapter 2 Yantif Ravensroke had been born in comfortable circumstances at Freynes on Zek, Alaster 503. His father, Lyle Ravensroke, calibrated micrometers at the Institute of Molecular Design. His mother held a part-time job as technical analyst at Orion Instruments. Two sisters, Fairfan and Juil, specialized respectively in a subphase of carpentry and the carving of mooring posts. At the Junior Academy, Yantif, a tall, thin, young man with a long, bony face and lank black hair, trained first in graphic design, then after a year reoriented himself into chromatics and perceptual psychology. At senior school, he threw himself into the history of creative imagery, despite the opinion of his family that he was spreading himself too thin. His father pointed out that he could not forever delay taking a specialty, that unrelated enthusiasms, while no doubt entertaining, would seem to merge into frivolity and even irresponsibility. Yantif listened with dutiful attention, but soon thereafter he chanced upon an old manual of landscape painting which insisted that only natural pigments could adequately depict natural objects, and further, that synthetic substances, being bogus and unnatural, subconsciously influenced the craftsman and inevitably falsified his work. Yantif found the argument convincing and began to collect, grind, and blend umbers and ochres, barks, roots, berries, and the glands of fish, the secretions of nocturnal rodents, while his family looked on in amusement. Lyle Ravensroke again felt obliged to correct Yantif's instability. He took an oblique approach to the topic. I take it that you're not reconciled to a life of abject poverty? Yantif, naturally mild and guileless, with occasional lapses into absent-mindedness, responded without hesitation. Certainly not. I very much enjoy the good things of life. Lyle Ravensroke went on in a casual voice. I expect that you intend to earn those good things, not by crime or fraud, but through your own good efforts. Of course, said Yantif, now somewhat puzzled. That goes without saying. Then how do you expect to profit from your training to date, which is to say a smattering of this and an inkling of that? Expertise is the word you must concentrate upon. Sure control over a special technique. This is how you put coin in your pocket. In a subdued voice, Yantif stated that he had not yet discovered a specialty which he felt would interest him across the entire span of his existence. Lyle Ravensrook replied that to his almost certain knowledge no divine fiat had ever ordained that toil must be joyful or interesting. Aloud, Yantif acknowledged the rightness of his father's views, but privately clung to the hope that, somehow, he might turn his frivolity to profit. Yantif finished his term at senior school with no great distinction, and the summer recess lay before him. During these few brief months, he must define the course of his future. Specialized study at the Lyceum, or perhaps apprenticeship as a technical draftsman. It seemed that youth, with all its joyful vagaries, lay definitively behind. In a morose mood, Yantif happened to pick up the old treatise on the depiction of landscapes, and there he encountered a tantalizing passage. For certain craftsmen, the depiction of landscapes becomes a lifelong occupation. Many interesting examples of the craft exist. Remember, the depiction reflects not only the scene itself, but the craftsman's private point of view. Another aspect to the craft must at least be mentioned, sunlight. The basic adjunct to the visual process varies from world to world, from a murky red glow to a crackling purple-white glare. Each of these lights makes necessary a different adjustment of the subjective-objective tension. Travel, especially transplanetary travel, is a most valuable training for the depictive craftsman. He learns to look with a dispassionate eye. He clears away films of illusion and sees objects as they are. There is one world where sun and atmosphere cooperate to produce an absolutely glorious light, where every surface quivers with its true and just color. The sun is the white star Dwan, and the fortunate world is Whist, Alaster, 1716. Juil and Fairfan decided to cure Yantif of his wayward moods. 
They diagnosed his problem as shyness and introduced him to a succession of bold and sometimes boisterous girls in the hopes of enhancing his social life. The girls quickly became either bored, puzzled, or uneasy. Yantif was neither ill-favored with his black hair, blue-green eyes, and almost aquiline profile, nor shy. Nevertheless, he lacked talent for small talk, and he suspected justly enough that his unconventional yearnings would only excite derision were he rash enough to discuss them. To avoid a fashionable social function, Yantif, without informing his sisters, took himself off to the family houseboat, which was moored at a pier on the Shard Sea. Fearful that either Juil or Firfan, or both, might come out to fetch him, Yantif immediately cast off the mooring lines and drove across Fallas Bay to the shallows, where he anchored his boat among the reeds. Solitude, the peace at last, thought Yantif. He boiled up a pot of tea, then settled into a chair on the foredeck and watched the orange sun myrrh settle toward the horizon. Late afternoon breeze rippled the water. A million orange coruscations twinkled among the slender black reeds. Yantif's mood loosened. The quiet, wide sky, the play of sunlight on the water were balm to his uncertain soul. If only he could capture the peace of this moment and maintain it forever. Sadly, he shook his head. Life and time were inexorable. The moment must pass. A photograph was useless, and pigment could never reproduce such space, such glitter and glow. Here, in fact, was the very essence of his yearnings. He wanted to control that magic linkage between the real and the unreal, the felt and the seen. He wanted to pervade himself with the secret meaning of things and use this lore as the mood took him. These secret meanings were not necessarily profound or subtle. They simply were what they were. Like the present circumstances, for instance, the mood of late afternoon, the boat among the reeds, with, perhaps most important of all, the lonely figure on the deck. In his mind, Yantif composed a depiction and went so far as to select pigments. He sighed and shook his head. An impractical idea. Even were he able to achieve such a representation, what could he do with it? Hang it on a wall? Absurd. Successive viewings would neutralize the effort as fast as repetition of a joke. The sun sank. Water moths fluttered among the reeds. From seaward came the sound of quiet voices in measured discussion. Yantif listened intently, eerie twinges coursing along his skin. No one could explain the sea voices. If a person tried to drift stealthily near in a boat, the sounds ceased. And the meaning, no matter how intently one listened, always just evaded intelligibility. The sea voices had always haunted Yantif. Once he had recorded the sounds, but when he played them back, the sense was even more remote. Secret meanings, mused Yantif. He strained to listen. If he could comprehend only a word so as to pick up the gist, then he might understand everything. As if becoming aware of the eavesdropper, the voices fell silent, and night darkened the sea. Yantif went into the cabin. He dined on bread, meat, and beer, then returned to his deck. Stars blazed across the sky. Yantif sat watching, his mind adrift among the far places, naming those stars he recognized, speculating about others. So much existed. So much to be felt and seen and known. A single life was not enough. Across the water drifted a murmur of voices, and Yantif imagined pale shapes floating in the dark, watching the stars. The voices dwindled and faded. Silence. Once more Yantif retreated into the cabin, where he boiled up another pot of tea. Someone had left a copy of the Transvoyer on the table. Leafing through the pages, Yantif's attention was caught by a heading. 
the Arabine Centenary, a remarkable era of social innovation on the planet Wist, Alastor 716. Your transvoyeur correspondent visits Unsibal, the mighty city beside the sea. Here he discovers a dynamic society propelled by novel philosophical energies. The Arabin goal is human fulfillment, in a condition of leisure and amplitude. How has this miracle been accomplished? By a drastic revision of traditional priorities. To pretend that racks and stress do not exist would cheapen the Arabin achievement, which shows no sign of flagging. The Arabins are about to celebrate their first century. Our correspondent supplies the fascinating details. Yantif read the article with more than casual interest. Whist rejoiced in the remarkable light of the sun Dwan, where, how did the phrase go, every surface quivers with its true and just color? He put the magazine aside and went once more out upon the deck. The stars had moved somewhat across the sky, that constellation known locally as the Shamizad had risen in the east and was reflected on the sea. Yantif inspected the heavens, wondering which star was Duan. Stepping back into the cabin, he consulted the local edition of the Alastair Almanac, where Duan was identified as a dim white star in the turtle constellation along the edge of the carapace. Yantif climbed to the top deck of the houseboat and scanned the sky. There, to the north, under the stator, hung the turtle, and there shone the pale flicker of Duan. Perhaps imagination played Yantif tricks, but the star indeed seemed charged with color. The information regarding Whist might have been only of idle interest, had not Yantif on the very next day noticed an advertisement sponsored by Central Space Transport Systems announcing a promotional competition. For that depiction, best illustrating the scenic charm of Zek, the system would provide transportation to and from any world of the cluster, with an additional 300 Ozals spending money. Yantif instantly assembled panel and pigments, and from memory rendered the shallows of the Shard Sea, with the houseboat at anchor among the reeds. Time was short. He worked in a fury of concentrated energy, and submitted the composition to the agency only minutes before the deadline. Three days later, he was notified, not altogether to his surprise, that he had won the grand prize. Yantif waited until evening to break the news to his family. They were astounded, both that Yantif's daubings could command value, and that he yearned for far stranger worlds. Yantif tried earnestly to explain his motives. Naturally, I'm not unhappy at home. How could I be? I'm just at loose ends. I can't settle myself. I have the feeling that, just out of sight, just past the corner of my eye, something new and shimmering and wonderful waits for me. If only I knew where to look. His mother sniffed. Really, Yantif, you're so fanciful. Lyle Ravensroke asked sadly. Haven't you any ambition for a normal and ordinary life? No shimmering flapdoodle, just honest work and a happy home? I don't know what my ambitions are. That's the entire difficulty. My best hope is to get away for a bit and see something of the cluster. Then perhaps I'll be able to settle down. His mother, in distress, cried, You'll go far from here and make your career, and we'll never see you again. Yantif gave an uneasy laugh. Of course not. I plan nothing so stern. I'm restless and uneasy. I want to see how other people live so I can decide how I want to live myself. Lyle Ravensroke said somberly, When I was young, I had similar notions. For better or for worse, I put them aside. Now I feel sure that I acted for the best. There's nothing out there that isn't better at home. Ferfan said to Yantif, There'll never be sour grass pie or brunts or shushings the way mother cooks. I'm prepared to rough it for a bit. I might even like the exotic foods. Ugh, 
said Juil. They all sound so odd and rank. The group sat silent for a moment. Then, If you feel you must go, said Juil's father, our arguments won't dissuade you. It's really for the best, said Yantif hollowly. Then when I come back with the wandered dust off my heels, I'll hopefully be settled and definite. And you'll be proud of me. But Janty, we're proud of you now, said Furfan without any great conviction. Juil asked, where will you go and what will you do? Jantif spoke with spurious joviality. Where will I go? Here? There? Everywhere? And what will I do? Everything. Anything. All for the sake of experience. I'll try the carbuncle mines on Arcady. I'll visit the Connecticut at Luz. Perhaps I'll drop at Erebus and spend a few weeks with the emancipated folk. Emancipated folk? growled Lyle Ravensroke. A twittering brook of dillybugs is more likely. Well, that's their charm. They only work thirteen hours a week. It seems to agree with them. Juil cried, You'll settle in Erebus and become emancipated and we'll never see you again. My dear girl, there is not the slightest chance of such a thing. Then don't go to Whist. The Transvoyer article said that people arrive from everywhere and never leave. Fearfan who also cherished secret dreams of travel, said wistfully, If it's such a wonderful place, perhaps we'd all better go there. Her father laughed humorlessly. I can't spare the time from work.